Okay, so first of all, a quick test on eyesight and reading. Thank you. Uh, if, if those who are just coming in would come close to the front, that would be great. That helps me. Um, what is the subject that we were dealing with last week? This is the eyesight test. More than a memory test, probably. It seems like eyesight and memory may both be struggling. Ty. Prayer matters. Prayer matters. Thank you. Uh, that was the subject. And um, why do we believe that this is such an important subject for us to be considering right now? Excuse me? Yeah, God commands us to pray. So from that point of view, this is always an important subject to prepare but, or to consider. Um, why for us at Grace would this be, of all the times when we might consider prayer, one that is particularly relevant and appropriate? Kathy? Right. Uh, as you know, we are looking at uh, undertaking, by God's grace, a program of ministry uh, this year according to our strategic plan. And as Kathy rightly points out, um, at critical moments and other moments in his ministry, uh, Jesus would give himself a way to pray. And um, so it's not inappropriate that we would do the same thing. Uh, a very important time for us um, to learn a little bit more about this subject. If God isn't with us in what we're trying to accomplish this year, how much will we achieve that is going to bring glory to him? I put the number up on the board last week. Yeah, zero. Absolutely zero. What church do we not want to be like out of all the seven churches in the uh, book of Revelation, first three chapters? Sardis, okay. Why don't we want to be like Sardis? I think I've got to stop turning sideways. I'm getting in between the microphone and the receiver. Why don't we want to be like Sardis? Wasn't that a good church? Wasn't it thought to be good, Jerry? No, that was, that was Ephesus. There was something about Sardis. Reputation. Did they have a good reputation? They had an excellent reputation. Would we like to have the reputation that Sardis had? Yeah, we'd like to have the reputation, but we'd like to have a reputation that is justified. Their reputation was that they were alive. Were they alive? No. The Lord Jesus looks at them and he says, you're dead. If you have a reputation that you're alive, then you must be doing lots of things. Um, that's why people could look at Sardis and say, look at that church. Look at all the things they're doing. There is a church that is alive. Um, and we really do not want to get into the position of having a reputation only for being alive because we're doing lots of things. There are many churches today, I think, that are in that situation. We do not want to join them. And so when we started to get into this subject... Um, we saw, I think, I think everybody agreed, either that or everybody was politely very quiet. Um, I think we agreed that on the subject of prayer, we have a lot of head knowledge. Uh, there's plenty of stuff on our website. Um, we can go there and we can see what prayer is and who it is that may pray and how it is that we should pray and when we should pray and where we should pray. 
on our domain, we have a list of subjects, of, of topics and needs, the things that we should pray about. And um, so we, we have a lot of information. And yet, we also found we have a lot of struggles, um, that none of us is having an easy time of it in our prayer lives. There are good reasons why that is likely always to be the case. But it means that there is a little bit of a disconnect going on between the, the things that are in our minds, and I, I proved, I think, to all of us just how much is in our minds because I put up acts, and I didn't have to say a thing. Everybody was saying, yeah, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. We know that stuff. So to repeat it again, I suppose, gives us a little bit of a refresher. But um, all it's going to do is confirm the knowledge in our head and may not help to deal with this disconnect between what we know and what we do. So we decided instead that we would try to dig in on this matter. What's the cause of the disconnect? And I suggested that there are probably two areas, two, two basic areas in which problems happen. One is where you have the heart, but you can't find the opportunity. And the other is where you find the opportunity, or you may have the opportunity, you just don't have the heart. Um, I'm, I think I'm revising my opinion on that a little bit. I think there's probably only one problem um, that we face. Because if you have the heart, what will happen to the opportunity? Hmm? Excuse me? You will make it. Um, Pastor Bryant has reminded us many times, I think it was Edwards who, who said, we all do what we want, basically. So if prayer is a priority for us and we realize how critical it is for us and our heart's desire is to be before the Lord in prayer, guess what? We will pray. So I'm coming down more and more to the view. Uh, obviously, there are situations that arise that can rob us, but those are outside our control. Um, when things are under our control, if we're not praying, it's a heart problem. So what I've put up on the board here is those problems that we identified in the heart. And uh, this is where I want to dig in a little bit more this morning. Um, and see if we can find, uh, we may find more problems, but this is a pretty good place to start. I want to find out if there are any ideas that we can have for helps. And the way this is laid out here, as you can see, we've got problems here. We've got space for solutions here. And here are some ideas that we talked about last week that really apply across the whole um, area, the, the idea of body ministry, that, uh, that we are here as the body of Christ, this ability to uh, use our gifts in order to help one another um, in, every, in many areas, certainly in this area if we're struggling with prayer. And uh, we also suggested that one thing that, uh, that might be helpful to us is this whole idea of prayer partnerships, of uh, ladies finding other ladies too, so that there, there are two or three all together, and um, working with them uh, to help each other to pray, praying for one another, encouraging one another, one another, checking up on one another's prayer lives, just to see how it's going praying with one another and encouraging one another to be at the prayer meetings. Um, and we'll, we'll say a little bit more about prayer meetings later because I know it's a drum that I beat a lot um, and I'm going to beat it some more this morning. Uh, and maybe explain why it's a drum that I beat a lot as well. So 
So let's try and work uh, on this table a little bit. Um, if we don't have the desire to pray, then the question is, how can we obtain that desire? Jerry? Okay. So we're if we're asking God, what, we're praying. Okay, that's interesting. If you don't have the desire to pray, one solution could be to pray. Yes, Kathy. Okay. Actually, if you don't want to clean your garage, spending time in prayer could be a very acceptable <laughs> alternative. <laughs> Timetable it. That is, uh, yeah, put aside a time every day that is inviolable. Um, I think it was uh, Susanna Wesley, um, John Wesley's wife, I think. I think they had 16 children, maybe maybe more. It was, it was a lot of children. And for her times, as I understand it, she would put a cloth that basically covered her um, because in the midst of a household with children, she had to do something in order to isolate herself and to get away. And I think that is, um, that is how she handled that, finding that time, scheduling that time to pray. Jan. Okay, that's going to have to be a bit smaller. Read the word. What happens when we read the word? The Holy Spirit applies it to us, uh, speaks to us, God speaks to us. We start to have our hearts revitalized, They're cold, they start to be thawed out. Um, we understand his love for us and part of the lack of desire for prayer is has to be that our hearts are cold towards God because he's the one we come to in prayer so if we start to see the desirability of God and his loveliness again in his word that's going to um, stoke the furnaces as it were of our hearts and, call, and reignite that, that love and that desire Okay, so that's good. Kathy? Okay. Fellowship. Um, that's where the, the body ministry and the prayer partners idea plays in particularly. But also, of course, when we meet together for worship on the Lord's Day, when we meet together for prayer midweek or the home Bible study groups, these are all places where we can experience that fellowship in the Lord, and that is always an encouragement to us. Um, our fellowship in the Lord, what, what, how would we describe that? We had a little bit of a an emphasis on this towards the end of last year. What is fellowship? Yes. It's worship. Okay. It's communion. It's, it's our relationship with God expressed as we have relationship with one another. It isn't. What isn't fellowship? Put it the other way around. Right. Okay. 
Yeah, okay. Here's a scenario. I'm just moving the microphone so it can see the receiver a bit better. Um, I think that'll, that's got it. Here's a scenario. Two believers meet. That's easy. Is that fellowship? Maybe. Not definitely. Two believers meet and talk about the weather. Is that fellowship? Two believers meet and talk about the bargain that they just got at the store yesterday. Is that fellowship? Two believers meet and they share what the Lord has been revealing to them in his word. Is that fellowship? Okay, so <coughs> fellowship is going to help because... It is that aspect of our relationship with one another where I think the Lord Jesus Christ is most clearly seen in one another. And that stirs up our heart because Christ is the focus. Okay, anything else? Donna. Donna. Right. Right. The heart is deceitful above all things. Sometimes as we read biographies or books that focus on the subject of prayer, it can help us shine a light, perhaps on a different angle on our own hearts and understand what the problem is and therefore take some action to help deal with it. Okay, well, that's, that's quite a lot that we can do there. I suspect we may find some of those things cascade over as we move down this list. Um, I've put James 5.16 there against the fact that we don't pray effectively, and that's because in that verse, and uh, I think it was Jerry brought that to our attention last week, uh, James says... Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So there are those times when we're not certain that our prayers are effective. They don't seem to be making much difference. Um, what can we do about that? James gives us a little hint. Jack. Again, looking at biographies of the effective prayers or, as I hope we may do later in this series, uh, looking at some of the effective men of prayer in the Bible. Um, but again, the solution does not seem to be to give up. What does James lay out as a condition for effective praying? Jan. Okay, confession. Repentance. Repentance. 
Stone. Right. We need to be obedient. If we have set about living in a in a willful and unrepented sin, and then we come to the Lord, is it any wonder if we don't feel that our prayers are being affected? It's, it's the righteous person uh, whose righteousness is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the one whose prayers, says, uh, says James, can accomplish much. So how do we put ourselves in a path of obedience? Jerry. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have to follow the example of Christ. We have to read his word, understand what the the imperatives, the commandments are, and we have to do them. Has, has God commanded us to do anything that we are incapable of doing in the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. Okay. You Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. But that's actually, that's the goal. I mean, I mean we, we heard this last week. We are, the instant we believe, we are positionally perfect in Christ. Okay. In the, in the generality of things, does the Lord command people to do things and then deprive them of the means? He actually hasn't deprived us of the means to become perfect. No. Well, where do we find the means? In his word. Anywhere else? Okay. His grace. Where will we find grace to help in time of need? Prayer. Where else might we obtain grace? Yes, Brian. Okay. We're commanded. That's right. We're, com- we're actually commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which in, in, a, in a certain sense is the same thing as having grace. Um, where are we going to get that grace, Donna? The means of grace. What are, what are the means of grace? Okay. What else? Okay. The word Fellowship. Right. Yep. The word, fellowship, prayer, and Baptism and the Lord's Supper. So, uh, and the Word, of course, is both the reading of the Word and the hearing 
of it preached. So those are some things we can do to help us to pray effectively. Then we have this matter of pride, and pride shows itself, I think, in a few ways. We had one example last week, which was <coughs> the situation where we're not very keen, or, or we don't, we want our will to be done. You know, this is so typical of little children. I want, and uh, whenever our children used to start that, we could probably get them here and they would testify to this. I want whatever it is. We would say to them, I want doesn't get. Um, and they would have to find a different way to express a request and not a demand. Jonah tells us a little bit about this. Um, it's actually a, one of those very moving passages uh, towards the end of Jonah chapter 3 and then through Jonah chapter 4. You remember how it was that Jonah was very reluctant in the first place to go to Nineveh because he knew what kind of people they were. And his big concern was that God is so gracious, he might actually not bring upon them the judgment that they deserved. But ultimately, after the fish was supplied and vomited Jonah out on the beach, he goes into Nineveh and he proclaims, just a few more days and Nineveh will be destroyed and the people turn from their sins and they show signs of genuine repentance and the Lord relents and Jonah is thrilled to bits. No. It greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. What's happened in Jonah's heart? Is he praying, your will be done? So then the Lord provides an illustration for him. Remember, he's, he's sitting out there hoping that yet the Lord may change his mind again and absolutely destroy Nineveh. And he's, he's perched up on a hillside or somewhere where he's got a good view of the city. And he's sitting there and the sun's beating down on him and he's getting really hot. And the Lord overnight causes this plant to grow up and to provide him shelter. And he's really pleased about the plant. It, it just, it, it's just wonderful, and it, it does his heart good, and he's, he's thrilled to bits. And then the Lord provides a worm, and overnight the plant is destroyed. How does Jonah react? He's angry again. Jonah was extremely happy about the plant, but then uh, the, the plant gets destroyed, and Jonah again says, death is better to me than life. And God said to Jonah, do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. And the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals. So the Lord is very gracious. Jonah's heart is so mixed up. He is so, he's concerned for the honor of God's name. But he gets angry because God is such a gracious God and relents from bringing calamity on those who repent. So that's one aspect of, I think, pride. This is what you ought to do, God. This is my will, and you're not doing it. How do we tackle that? Excuse me? Repent. Repent. <laughs> 
repentance. We talked last week about surrendered prayer. The, you know, the Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray every day, because it's clearly meant to be a daily theme of our prayers, your will be done. And Jonah had got himself into a position where that was the last thing on his heart. Another element of, um, I'll just put Jonah there as shortcut. Uh, another element of this, of course, is um, the kind of pride that we see in the Pharisee. And you know, the, the story of the Pharisee and the publican. I always think it's fascinating and, and significant how it's actually worded, what the Pharisee was doing. First of all, it talks about the publican who wouldn't even look up to heaven. I am the sinner, God be merciful to me. Uh, and then it says, but the Pharisee. What did the Pharisee do? Okay, that's, that's what he said. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Like, for example, this publican here. I do this and this and this and this. <sighs> but what does the scripture actually say he was doing? Um, no, well, not in, not in those terms. In terms of prayer, what was he doing? Brian. Yeah. He prayed to himself. He certainly wasn't praying to God. Oops. And that's what pride will do to us. What does God do to the proud? opposes the proud but gives grace to whom? To the humble. So that suggests that we have, in both of these cases, we have to come in a humble and surrendered manner. One other element which, um, which can play into this, uh, particularly when we're in a group, um, is that we can be so concerned about what other people will think of the way that we pray that we spend a lot of time, maybe that actually shuts us down so that we don't pray anything at all because we're worried about the, the judgment that these other people will make, oh, that's not a very good prayer, is it? Oh, listen to the way he said that. Oh, that wasn't very educated. Oh, that was a grammatical error. And so we don't pray because we're worried about what other people will think. Um, and then we hear uh, a brother or a sister pray, and it's fluent, and it's eloquent, and it's kind of Jane Austen language and beautifully constructed and we think, oh, I could never pray like that. Um, anything wrong with those attitudes? What? It yeah. Who, who are we actually praying to? If we're, praying, we're praying for their benefit. We're praying to get their admiration. Or we're not praying because we're concerned about the fact that we may not achieve a certain grade in, in, in their eyes. I told, uh, I think I was telling Jerry this story um, last week, and some others of you will have heard it as well. There's two stories, in fact, about the kind of place we can get to in our praying. Um, if we're not careful. And one of them was a, an example of a, a, a man in a fellowship who was concerned to pray for the ladies in the fellowship who were in various situations. 
Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and in his mind, he's thinking of this, this idea of the fact that uh, Christ is the head of the church and the man is the head of the woman. And so he's, he's got this idea of the women in relation to the men in the fellowship. And so he prays something along these lines. Lord, we pray for those that haven't any heads. And we pray for those that have had heads and lost them. Okay, now there was another man at a prayer meeting once who was praying for the whole idea of persecution and the fact that we don't see much persecution, at least uh, not as much as in former times. And he was thinking about the days of Whitfield and Wesley and how when they stood in the open air to preach, they suffered persecution. In fact, they had the carcasses of dead animals thrown at them. And so his prayer went something along these lines. Dead cats. Our forefathers, they had dead cats thrown at them. We don't know what it is to have dead cats thrown at us. I'm not sure if he went on to say, show us what it is. But um, I hope I'm making the point here. We, sometimes we can hear things and we can adopt them and, and it, if we actually took a pen and wrote down word for word the things that, that we say to God in prayer, I wonder if we would conclude that we had been actually talking to a real person. Because we can adopt so many forms and so many niceties of this evangelicalese language. And one of the reasons why we do it, I think, is because we want to fit in and we want to be part of, of, of that tradition that we have heard from others. And it, if it really is on the heart, I'm sure our brothers and sisters will bear with us and there isn't necessarily anything wrong with it. But I do think perhaps we need to give a little bit of a consideration to that. The Lord's looking at the heart in all of this. That's what real prayer is. It's the heart finding its expression through, um, well, sometimes not even through the mouth, but the heart expressing itself and in, in these kinds of prayers through the mouth. Okay, now, um, another scripture. Oh, yes, we've looked at that one. Let's take a look at uh, this next one of unbelief. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The problem of unbelief. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Um, what is the answer to unbelief? Lord, I believe, <laughs> help my unbelief. Um, what else? Jerry? Okay. See you above. Could the Lord's Supper help us with unbelief? Could fellowship help us with unbelief? Once again, it comes down to these means of grace. Okay, worldliness. Um, J. 
James again, who seems to have a lot to say on problems with prayer. You do not have, this is James chapter 4, verse 2, picking it up in the middle of the verse. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So, worldliness seems to imply, well, it's a wrong heart. We're asking for things with wrong motives. Are we going to be answered if we come with the wrong motives? What does James say? Yeah, you won't receive. How are we going to deal with worldliness? This perhaps is one of the critical things that living in this day and age in the west coast of the United States, we have to face. It is all around us. It is pervasive. You can't turn on the radio. You can't turn on the television. You can't go to a movie. You can't do anything without being bombarded by worldly thoughts, worldly ambitions, worldly desires. How are we going to deal with it? Fred. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I think we started to see a pattern emerging here. But certainly, if we are in love with the world, we're going to have a lack of desire for God. Friendship with the world is enmity toward God. What's the solution? It is, once again, as we've seen before, the means of grace. We need grace. We need uh, to read the word. We need to sit under the word preached. We need to pray. Um, We need to be at the Lord's Supper and to, to participate in it. We need to take advantage of opportunities to have true fellowship. We need to make sure that we do not quench the Spirit and we do not grieve the Spirit. There were some scriptures on that. Donna. Right. Uh, that's a rubber hitting the road kind of question, isn't it? How committed? Oops. 
าน้อยคือ I want to be <coughs> and this also feeds back into what we were talking about last week about wearing the mask because we want people to believe of us I think that we are sold out for the Lord that we're on fire um, that's That's the human heart, isn't it? Let's face it, it's deceitful. And the, Don, uh, the question that Donna has, has raised is, uh, do we want to be like that? Do we want to walk the walk and not just talk the talk? Sorry for all these corporate Americanisms. I think I need to seek therapy. Some of, some of us might be quite happy to be at, uh, at Sardis. But this is talking about actually being what the Lord Jesus Christ died, gave up his life to make us. Um, and so maybe one thing that we're being called to at the beginning of 2011 is to examine that and to answer this question for ourselves and by the grace of God to recommit to repent in those areas where the world has come in, where our desire has been quenched, where as, uh, uh, as Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 22, it's quite interesting what he says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, do not quench the spirit. Immediately after saying, pray without ceasing, give thanks in everything, rejoice always, that's God's will for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And then he writes to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Fellowship, prayer partners, body ministry. What does he go on to say? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Um, echoes of quite a few of the things we've been thinking of, and certainly some of the things that Donna just brought to our attention. Okay, now, we're just about out of time. I haven't yet got to the consideration of the, the great men of prayer from the Bible. Um, we could certainly do that next week. I love those passages, and they're, they're pretty instructive. These are men who knew how to pray effectively, um, or at least were enabled to do so by God. And we'll see how some of these things... Um, weren't true in their cases. Um, if, if you would like to do that, if you think that would be helpful, then uh, we, can, we can do that next week. Any? Yep. Okay, let's do that. And the, and the three that we're going to be looking at in particular are Abraham uh, in, in the prayer that he made for Sodom and Gomorrah, um, Jacob wrestling with God just before he was going to meet Esau, and Moses um, in the incident of the golden calf and the, the likely effects that that was going to have on the relationship between God and the nation of Israel. And uh, we'll see how they were enabled to pray, and that, I think, will be helpful to us. 
But I said I was going to beat the, the prayer meeting drum. Um, and so, actually, I'm going to let you beat it for me. Why would the prayer meeting matter? Surely we can, we can do all of this just in our own homes. We can get into a room, shut the door. Surely we can do all of that. Why do we need a prayer meeting? Perhaps we don't. Jerry? God answers prayer, but won't he answer prayer if we're at home as well? So we don't need a prayer meeting. Do we? Kathy? I, Kathy just gave a very full answer, and it was all good stuff. Uh, let me try and summarize. The first is it's fellowship, okay? You can't do that at home, on your own, in a room. You, obviously, you can commune with the Lord, but fellowship among the saints. The second is we have seen in, in our reasons to pray, God looks upon the church, the body of Christ, when they gather to pray, there is something special in his sight that isn't there at, at another time. That's not to say that God won't hear at another time, but there is the special blessing when the body comes together. Um, that's pretty clear. Um, Jesus, in giving us the Lord's Prayer, said, when you pray, say this, my Father in heaven. No, he intended that his children, his brothers and sisters, would be together in prayer. We saw the church in, in Jerusalem, we see it in Scripture, praying when some of the apostles are in prison. There's a prayer meeting called together. They join together as the body and they pray. Um, there is the the point also about the encouragement that we have in hearing our brothers and sisters lifting up requests to the Lord. Um, and the instruction, if we had, had an issue about, well, how would I pray for a certain thing? Maybe we'll hear a brother or a sister pray and we think, that's absolutely right. I can see how that prayer comes out of Scripture. And that is a way to pray for that issue. I'm not saying that we should necessarily emulate forms of speech and types of language because we've seen already this morning that that can sometimes get us down a, a little bit of a blind alley. But in terms of an approach to the Lord and, and how to be biblical, um, I think that is uh, a way that we can instruct one another and lift one another up. And uh, this is another drum that I beat from time to time. It's really encouraging when we come together as the body of Christ and a brother or a sister is before the Lord and expressing the burden of their heart when they get to the end, if we all say what? Amen. Um, this is... I've said this before, I'll say it again. It's a cultural thing. If you go to a church in England and you go to the prayer meeting, you're going to be surprised. Um, because there, you get to the end of a prayer and there's a very audible, Amen. 
Now, that doesn't guarantee the heart of the people who are saying it, and there are other things that, you know, we, we did a study on this a while ago. But I, I, I said last time, I, I spoke about this, it's something I really struggled with when, when we came to the States, and I'd be in a prayer meeting, and as far as I could tell, the Lord had laid something on my heart, and I'd expressed my heart before the Lord, and I said, Amen. And th there's nothing did I make a mistake? Maybe now I'm starting to be concerned about what other people think, and I shouldn't be. But the Bible talks about us giving the amen. So let it be. And uh, I think if we could learn to do that, um, that would be a means to encourage one another in our praying as well. Okay, the means of grace. They shine through here as something that the Lord has given to us, not just, of course, to help us in prayer, um, but we're not going to do without them. We're not going to do very well in prayer without them, clearly. If we're struggling with prayer, what do we need to do? Pray and ask for help. We need to read the word. We need to be at the services of worship. Listen to the word preached. We need to engage in every opportunity that the Lord provides us for fellowship. We need to be at the Lord's table and participating in it appropriately. If we haven't yet been baptized, then, uh, and we are true believers, then we are living in straight out, flat out, disobedience to the Lord. There's no other way to put it. It's, it's not a matter of something you need to think about and pray about. If you're a believer in the Lord and you have not been baptized, the commandment is be baptized. We need to take these things seriously. Here's the question. How committed am I? How committed do I want to be? and our approach to the means of grace, and our using them, and, and taking advantage of every opportunity as the body of Christ uh, is critical in that whole thing. Any questions as we, uh, or comments as we come to a close? Okay, well, let's pray then.